Um, our first speaker is Dr. Ken Alford. Um, Dr. Ken Alford uh, is an associate professor of church history and doctrine at Brigham Young University. After serving almost 30 years in, the active, in active duty in the United States military, he retired as a colonel in 2008. Uh, while on active duty, Ken served in numerous assignments, including the Pentagon, eight years teaching at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, and four years as professor and department chair at the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. His research focuses primarily on Latter-day Saint participation in military conflicts. Ken and his wife, Shirley, have four children and 10 grandchildren. Ken, as you can see here, is presenting to us on the establish establishing the gospel in Afghanistan. Good morning. Let's, uh, let's do this. This is the first time the gospel has been established in a Muslim country in a wartime setting. Um, this is really unique. And to put things in perspective, um, when September 11th happened in 2001. You remember President Hinckley's comment, he's up at the podium in general conference, he's interrupted at the podium and he's handed a note. And the only time I can think of in my lifetime of that ever happening, he announces to the entire church that operations have begun in Afghanistan. And then he gives that great talk called The Times in Which We Live. Highly recommend taking a look at that, that talk when you have a few minutes. We move into Afghanistan very quickly after 9-11. They try to send a signal with special forces and a little bit about this country. Uh, we've been at war in Afghanistan for almost 13 years now. That's twice and a half as long as World War II, the American involvement. This is a poor country. The only thing Afghanistan leads the world in is alphabetic. In every other measure, they're almost on the bottom. They have a 44-year life expectancy. They're 75% illiterate. Only 6% of the water in the entire country is drinkable. This is a poor, poor country. And, 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 and talking to many of my friends that have deployed, they said when you walk out of the gate, you go from the 21st century to the 12th century. And that can happen in a few hundred feet. As we started into Afghanistan, it's formally known or was known at the beginning as Operation Enduring Freedom, OEF, contrasted with OIF, Operation Iraqi Freedom later. Um, as we move across that country, the Taliban falls very quickly. Uh, within just a matter of weeks, the special forces and CIA have taken down the Taliban government, and then we begin moving forces in. And with those forces, of course, come Latter-day Saint men and women. Not only service members, but the government officials in the State Department. We have people that volunteered to teach at Kabul University. We have Latter-day Saints who serve in non-governmental organizations or NGOs. And very quickly, we have Latter-day Saints across the height and breadth of Afghanistan. As we look at this, from 2001 to 2002, it's just scattered individual church groups. State presidents are setting apart group leaders who are going with their units, and it's, it's quite frankly just not organized on a, on a large scale as the military is moving in there. In 2003, the church realizes we have a lot of Latter-day Saints in country. We have hundreds of Latter-day Saints by that point in country. And they assign Afghanistan, which was previously unassigned, to the Asia area. And they have an Area 70 authority, Elder William Jackson, who's now working up at the uh, MTC. And um, he is in New Delhi, in India. And he's assigned responsibility as the area authority for Afghanistan and basically is given the charge, organize the gospel in an entire country. What happens is an LDS chaplain by the name of Mark Allison comes in, and Mark is assigned, this is kind of a new calling, he's assigned a shepherd for the country. And he starts to coordinate these individual service groups and starts to work with the group leaders and get to know them and try to track people down working with Elder Jackson. One of the challenges, though, is priesthood keys are not in the country, and it makes things a little bit difficult. They do have a conference in December of that year. It's the very first church conference held in, in Afghanistan. It's held in Bagram. And please note, this is not for the Afghans. This is for the coalition forces that are moving in. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about proselyting in a few minutes. But 70 folks actually attend that first conference at Bagram. They hold several conferences in the months after. And Elder Jackson is able to attend several of those conferences actually coming into country, which is kind of exciting. 2004 to 2006, the church continues to get better organized. Um, Chaplain Allison has left, but more LDS military service members and civilians arrive in country. 
the organization begins to improve and we have a whole series of improvements across the country, we start to have organized service member groups that are really approaching branch status, especially in Kabul, in Bagram, in Kandahar as you look about the country. These are pictures from those early days. This is in the center here. We can get that, let's see, there's uh, Chaplain Allison and that's Elder Jackson. And then we have groups meeting around. LDS uh, Charities starts providing materials in. The branches, or the uh, service member groups there start providing that out to the Afghans as they can. And uh, again, we have hundreds and hundreds of, of Latter-day Saints in country. Just real quick, this is a former guy I got a home teach. That's Perry Oaks. His dad is Elder Robert C. Oaks. He's an Air Force officer that was over in, in Kabul. This is the first baptism recorded in the nation of Afghanistan. This is in history as far as we know. Uh, this Corporal Alejandro Rangel is, is baptized and it's a really great event. You see the picture there on the left and, and those are really nice baptismal clothes, aren't they? And this is in a war environment. So the question might arise in your mind, how do they get such nice baptismal clothes? We don't even have that nice of baptismal clothes in our war. Well, let me just share a story. This is from Ch Chaplain Allison. He said, we utilized an, an improved wading pool made by the Marines near the flight line at Coalition Forces Base Bagram and surrounded it on all sides with weapons and munitions of war. If you notice in the background of that baptismal picture, you can see several rifles peeking into the picture. And as you look at the setting apart and confirmation, everybody in the outside circle has an M16 slung over their shoulder. This is not a normal baptism and confirmation, okay? But let me share this, I, I just love this story. He said, as I made preparations for the battlefield baptism, I knew we needed white clothing, which is something we obviously lacked. I spoke up at a meeting of fellow military chaplains and asked if any of them had white clothing I could borrow for a Latter-day Saint baptism. My request was met with awkward silence. I mean, who brings white clothes to a, a war zone? Suddenly, one of the Catholic chaplains, Father Hubs, an army chaplain said, I have two white cleric robes that you are welcome to use if you don't mind baptizing him in Catholic robes. Hearing in another room, a priest said, oh, you don't wanna do that, Father. That water's dirty, it'll stain your white robes. To which the Catholic priest reported, if that happens, I could not think of a better cause. And both the baptizer and the corporal being baptized are wearing Catholic priest robes as they're being baptized. What a, I just think that's a, just a great story. As we, Move in then, in 2007, the, the individual in the middle here with the, uh, the white shirt and the, uh, the hard hat, that's Gene Weichel. If there's a hero in this entire story, it's Gene. Gene comes into country as the senior military advisor for the entire Afghan National Army Corps. Comes into country actually in 2006. In 2007, he's called to be a group leader in Kabul. Very quickly though, the church assigns him to what's called senior group leader status. This is, this is something new, the church hasn't done this before. It's kind of a follow on to what Chaplain Allison had as the, uh, the special uh, representative there. Gene's in a unique position because as the representative to the entire Afghan Air Force, he has rights and ability to fly almost anywhere within the country. And so he meets with the area authorities that have been assigned at that point and recommends that they start organizing branches. Uh, the first presidency meets with several members of the 12 and the Military Relations Committee and they extend the call to Brother Gene Weichel to become district president of the Afghan Kabul district. Here's the first district presidency. Consists of an Air Force officer, Rod Holliger, um, and uh, Brother Noyce, his second counselor, uh, and they very quickly move out and organize the church across Afghanistan. And let me just give you kind of a feel for this. As this is happening, the church now assigns it to a regular area presidency desk. They're assigned to the Middle East North Africa desk, which has 19 other countries. This is a huge area of responsibility. It's Elder Neunschwander and Elder uh, Porter, that's Elder Bruce Porter, and it's overseen by Elder Holland, because each of the areas falls under a member of the 12. And they take a very active role. Um, Gene says that uh, we've had a chance to interview and talk to Gene and his wife, Susan. Susan remains, by the way, in Arizona the entire time. But as they're doing this, 
they're constantly on the phone because they're figuring this out as they go along. There are five military branches organized. These are in the larger Air Force and Army locations across Afghanistan, large geographic distances. Afghanistan is the size of Texas, and it's a, it, huge distances, and you just can't drive on the roads because of the uh, insurgency. They organize 27 service member groups. This is anywhere from a handful to several dozen service members. And then they have another 35 locations when they first organize that has one member of the church. And in many cases, it's a sister. So sacrament becomes a real challenge and is only done sporadically. If you can imagine having over 60 organizations under your district in a wartime where most of your people are working 15 and 16 hour days, you start to get a feel for what's going on. And by the way, it's 14 countries that are contributing to your district and it's 700 people. And in no two weeks in a row does your membership list stay the same, okay? Um, it's a really crazy situation. This is the branch in Kabul as it, as it opens up. This is, their, this is just days after the, uh, the district is created. And you, you get a feel for that size there. Uh, Kabul is more civilian, even to this day, than the other outlying areas, which are primarily military. This is the second branch created in Afghanistan, uh, primarily an Air Force group with some Army folks at Bagram. And this just gives you a feel for that district presidency's area of responsibility. They have members and organized units in every one of those dots. Wow, if that's your, have a nice day, okay? Um, his district executive secretary is, he's a superhero. Um, we were uh, in, in email contact a lot and he's, he was just a superhero. I don't know how else to say it. Um, this is the branch three years later, it's larger. That's Elder Bruce Carlson, retired four-star Air Force General, uh, member of the 72nd Quorum in the center and able to visit in country. Um, and as we move through this, I wanna just take the next few minutes and talk about some wartime accommodations because you can't have a normal district if you're in a, in a war zone in the middle of a Muslim country. So here's some accommodations they made. When President Weichel was called, he was called not only as a district president, but interestingly, he was also called as a mission president. And that has continued through his replacements. The reason is, is as a district president, he did not hold all of the priesthood keys he would need to operate autonomously. But as a mission president, he does. And so priesthood keys were now for the first time in Afghanistan. And soldiers had the opportunity to, to meet with a judge in Israel and work through whatever issues they needed to work through in country. Second, finding members was just a challenge because no one's records ever go to Afghanistan. They stay in any number of home wards and branches across the United States and Canada and these other countries that are there. So what they do is they have a weekly email system. They started this back in 2008, it continues today. And the district presidency contacts their members by email and says, uh, you know, for some of you, this will be church this week. Please open up your scriptures and check what, you know, whatever the particular devotional message is. And they have a whole other layer on top of church organization, which is military coordination. They work very closely with the chaplains. They work very closely with the military groups that are in the area. They have to get buildings and facilities and work with State Department. And it's just whatever assignment you have here stateside, enjoy it. <laughs> it's, much, it's much calmer than, than what they're experiencing over there. Uh, by the way, is that not a cool branch photo on the right on the bottom? That's from Bagram. I just thought that was the coolest branch photo ever, okay? Um, by the way, that's uh, Jill Stevens up on the uh, top right. She served with the Utah National Guard and was later uh, Miss Utah. They also have several other accommodations. One, the very first thing they do is they realize that the home teaching and visiting teaching system that we use outside of war zones is not really going to do it for them. It's a great start, but a once a month visit isn't what they want. So they create something called Mormon Battle Buddies, and these are a couple of the Mormon Battle Buddy pairs. And these Mormon Battle Buddies are set up to be there on their right hand and on their left to help them stay out of temptation and also to just keep track of them and to be there to just be a friend. Sometimes these Battle Buddies are the only other member of the church in their unit. And they set these Battle Buddies up and they continue to this day. And it's the, the Battle Buddies response, but almost like a missionary companionship. Uh, when they are able to, they put them in the same unit and they're able to, to work with each other. 
Another thing they do is, you know, we have, this is the first, as far as I know, Combat Relief Society president on the, on the, uh, the left there. This is Lieutenant Colonel Shear, U.S. Army. Um, let me just do a blow up of the uh, B Cobble Branch Relief Society here. She's packing heat, okay? How do you think visiting teaching goes over there? I'm gonna guess it's really, really good, okay? Um, she's also wearing the pistol in the first photo there, but it's got the other safety strap on, so it's a little bit harder to see. Apparently they weren't doing well that week and she unstrapped one of the safety harnesses and needed to say no more. Um, the other sisters there in that group, a uh, couple of them work at the university, a couple of them are secretaries and, and uh, representatives from the State Department, and I believe one of them works for the Red Cross or Red Crescent as it's called in Afghanistan. And so what we've got now is we've got settings apart. Settings apart are done so weird because you can't meet with the people many times. President Weichel called this woman to be the counselor in the Relief Society presidency and neither he nor the president who she's standing by had ever met. They did it over the phone. They also set apart with a letter that comes out of Salt Lake. These folks actually met in Utah after they all returned from Afghanistan. They have other things, you know, they're awarding medals, they're meeting with chaplains, they're doing all kinds of things, humanitarian efforts, and they are not able to proselyte. President Weichel is a mission president, but they can only proselyte among the service members and civilians that are there from the coalition forces. They cannot proselyte to the Afghans. They also have real concerns over the word of wisdom because Afghan, which since you can't drink the water, everyone drinks tea and tea makes the country run. It's called chai and chai is the social lubricant that runs the entire country. They also meet here. This is the uh, 5th of, of March, yeah, so yesterday, four years ago. The only thing that's unusual about this meeting is it's Friday. They hold their church meetings in Kabul on Friday because that's the Muslim day of worship and that's when the embassy is closed. Well, they did something really interesting. They were, it was time for a district conference, but this is a district that has 67 separate sites. They've never met many of the branch presidents, let alone the group leaders. They'll never meet together for a district conference ever. And so what Salt Lake did is put together a DVD and they had Elder Nunchwander and Elder Porter and Sister Beck give presentations. And then they taped a presentation from President Weichel in Afghanistan and his District Relief Society president, Carol Thompson. And they spliced them all together and it ended, well, first they sent out uh, over a thousand copies in country and they sent copies to the families as well. So they also on the same day, that 5 March 2010, watch, this is President Weichel's wife, Susan, watching in Arizona. Well, and she sees Jean speaking there. And last, the member of the 12 that was responsible for this area spoke. I would like to play you a clip from the ending of his presentation. I think this gives you a feel and a flavor for what's going on over there. Let's see if I can. God bless the families of the service men and women who serve this church and this nation. Brethren and sisters, we've had a wonderful district conference with you. As I said at the beginning, I only wish we could see your faces. I wish we could have stood with you to sing as we stood here to sing. Wish we could shake your hand. More than that, I wish we could lay our hands on the head of each one of you and give you a blessing. So, in lieu of being able to do that personally, I'm going to do it apostolically. I'm going to do it by the authority that is mine through this telecast and onto this DVD. So by the power of the Holy Priesthood that I hold and the authority that I've been given, I pronounce a blessing on each one of you within the sound of my voice and the reach of this telecast. I do it as if indeed my hands were upon your head and with the power of the priesthood upon you just that efficaciously. I bless each one of you that although you live in harm's way daily, that you'll have the power of heaven upon you, including the attendance of angels on your right hand and on your left. I bless you that you'll know that you're being prayed for at home and abroad, and especially by the leaders of the church here at headquarters, all of us, 
And we pray for your loved ones, wherever they may be, wherever home is. I bless you that you'll be true to your covenants, that you'll keep the commandments, that you'll be men and women on a mission, and that you'll strive to help others to embrace the gospel and live their religion. I bless you that such a time of war and such a period away from home will be a strengthening time, not a debilitating time in your life, in the formation of your character, and in the strengthening of your faith. The seeds of the gospel have been planted in Afghanistan. I'll put much more in the, the essay that will be in the book. But how wonderful it is to see this begin. Lives have been changed. The gospel's true. I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.